Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm Seamus, and I'm very happy to be back here again. Uh, it was my uh, big excuse to come back here again so that I can meet some of you by trying to share some of my uh, experience for the last one year. Um, basically, we are in public relations, so um, public relations have gone through many, uh, not many changes for the many decades because you look at, let's say, uh, uh, doing media relations with uh, journalists, you typically send a press release to the media, and there will be a text document, you will email to the, to the journalist, uh, you may send, uh, in old days, you send a fax, or you even send a press kit in printed form. But why are we talking about video today? It's because video has transformed the entire corporate communications uh, arena. We are talking about video that is transplanting uh, audio podcasts, that is completely transplanting text communication. So we need to look at why or how we can use video for marketing to a variety of uh, uh, in, in, a, in a variety of industries, whether it be enterprise or consumer. Okay. okay, so this is Oli, the movie. It is a real movie. It's a full-length feature movie that's, well, I would say critically acclaimed. So what's so special about this movie? Anyone have a wild guess? Anyone heard of Oli, the movie? Nobody, right? Okay. Here's what's unique about Olive. What is this? <laughs> iPhone, right? This movie was produced on a smartphone. This complete full featured movie was shot on a Nokia smartphone with a bit of customization, but basically you're looking at a full high quality production that's shot on a smartphone. Something like that. Okay? So this director actually wanted to challenge the norm and challenge our perception that movies has to be big expensive cameras with you know fancy gadgets and stuff like that. Well, he shot this very beautiful, very tranquil, very poignant uh, movie just on a smartphone. And that's what I hope to share with you that movie making or video making is not something that's restricted to someone with expensive tools. I'm going to show you what are some of the stuff that you can do to communicate better using video on the road, on the run, with nothing but a smartphone, maybe using a camera like that, but not with big, expensive, heavy equipment. We don't need to be, you know, weightlifting tons of equipment these days. You can carry something in your pocket and shoot good movies, or at least good videos, on the road. On the road. Okay, so here's what we're going to talk about. Um, what are some of the vehicles of mass communication available today? And why use video? And what are some of the online videos that we're looking at today? And why we need to look at online video? And then we need to look at how to produce this video. So I'll give you some short tips on how to acquire some of the easiest equipment to use, and also to, uh, some of the tips on how to put the videos together, and how to go live to the world. These days, if you look at a broadcast station, right? Broadcast is all about live, going live. Some journalist on the ground is going to interview somebody, and that footage is gone, has gone live. And then you can view it real time at the same time on a TV channel, right? A physical device. But now, 70% of people are moving away from television sets and seeing videos on their smartphones. Now people are retrieving news on their smartphones and they're seeing news on the smartphones. So what happens is that we are now wrestling the control from broadcasters away from them and then taking it back ourselves. As communicators, we can wrestle the control back into our own hands. And that's what's happening. How do we then go live? Not just stream the video on demand, but how to go live, real time, communicate real time, let's say a live event, how do you go live to the world? So I'll share with you some possible equipment you can use to actually put together live streaming events. Okay? And of course, I think the dream of all marketers is to do something like what we just see, uh, seen just now, or leave the movie. So movies, short movies or long feature movies can be a very powerful marketing tool, can be a very powerful communication tool. How do you actually go beyond just plain short video making to filmmaking? So what are, what are some of the paradigm shifts that we need to look at? How do we actually view the world as a filmmaker, not just someone who takes you know, video? So how do we move our visual and mental paradigm away from that to communicate in a filmmaking uh, a brain? Okay? okay, here's some of the stuff that most of us have done at some point or another. We have sent out text documents to people, right? So news releases, white papers, contributed paper. Uh, we send up arts, which may be photographs, right? We send the journalists to send uh, photographs, right? We send illustrations, infographics. Infographics is very big now. That means if you want to um, reach out to the world now, actually two of the things, the easiest things to do now is infographics and video. So if you have very nice charts, tables, illustrations, or some kind that 
uh, explain a good concept, infographics is very powerful to reach there. Okay. Audio, well, increasingly declining because it's transplanted by video. So we'll look at uh, online also, some of the other things that you can do online. And of course, video live streams as well as on demand. And another big paradigm now is what we call gamification. That means, how do we take corporate content and transform it into almost like a, an interactive game? People love games. If you take the MRT, well, all the guys here seem to not take MRT very much. So anyway, if you do take the MRT, you observe that maybe a big proportion of them are doing two things on the train. Watching Korean TV series, which is video, right? Or playing a game. So that is the paradigm shift of where the younger generation is moving to. So to communicate with the younger generation, we need to actually move our paradigm away from some of the old things that we've been doing. Okay. So why use video? Okay, so if you, have, if you have been in any part of the world for the last few months, I think you know what this is. I'll only play the last part, but I think you get an idea. Gangnam Style is this Korean pop song by this uncle, right? that means guys like me, about 50 years old. Uh, so it's done by a, not a very interesting looking Korean pop star, because the rest of the Korean pop stars are beautifully packaged of whatever gender, right? So why did he, I mean, he became really popular. In fact, if you look at the YouTube top trending videos that you watch, his video is now number one. One billion views. One billion people have viewed it. Number one, right? And another video, or well, <coughs> top, I think it's a like top few, top five, whatever, is a 500 million view video that was posted in 2007. It's trended to the top five or top three or whatever. It's 500 million. Guess what is it? It's called Charlie Beat My Finger Again. Go Google it later, okay? Search Charlie Beat My Finger Again. It's just a baby with an elder brother who is somewhat like a toddler himself. And the baby is biting the finger of the elder brother. And that has reached 500 million views on YouTube. So you see that is the paradigm shift that we need to look at. Why can I start 1 billion views? A baby biting the elder brother's finger, 500 million views. And then if we post a corporate video on YouTube, nobody watch. <laughs> right? So we need to shift our brain to see how we can adapt corporate communication to a completely different paradigm. Okay, so we're looking at a decay or even broadcast media, like we said, we're wrestling control away from the traditional media. And now news is mobile, news is mobilized, smartphone able, right? Or tablet able. According to Cisco, which is a networking company, uh, they make enterprise uh, networking equipment, they make things like, you know, that power the internet, the backend. They say that online video is now greater than 50% of the entire internet traffic. So they measure that, and they say that now video is taking more than 50% of the traffic out there. So less and less people are using, you know, all the text communications or even instant messaging or that is declining. And Mobile video has 271 million users and will reach 1.6 billion in just a few years' time. So if you're looking at a trend of devices, even something like a tablet is going away because the smartphone is going to replace all that. That's why I think there's a big war and Apple is losing big in the, in the smartphone arena because they don't really have a device that caters to somewhere between the smartphone and the fat tablet. So they come out, Samsung and some of the other competitors come out what we call tablets, phone tablets, right? Okay, online video. What is SEO? Some of you would know. Search engine optimization. To appear on the internet, just having a website is not enough. You need to take the website public, right? That means someone needs to see. To make someone see, you need to optimize the website such that it can be found. Uh, in the old days, circa 1996 to maybe 2000, uh, you create a website and then you actually do site submission. I wonder anyone of you have. Anyone try submitting a website to search engines? Raise hands, nobody. Oh, no. Right, okay. So in the old days, we actually had to submit our websites to site submission to make sure that they, they will come and spider our website. That means index all the content on our website. Now we don't do that. Once the website goes live, 
all the search engines out there will be able to find you in no time by themselves. So therefore you say, then I don't need search engine optimization, it should be found. No. That's because the algorithm of Google, for example, has changed so much that if your website has got no content, they don't bother. They will drop your page, right? Right? If you try to cheat, that means what they call black black hat SEO, they will drop your page, right? For example, if you start your website with a lot of keywords that are redundant, put in competitors' keywords that are redundant, that have no semblance to the content that you are posting, they will drop you off the chart. So the only way to actually appear out there is to have real content. So to have real content means two things. You have a lot of text, which nobody reads, right? Or your video. So video need to be in a way that can be found. In video, you can't really find it except by the title and maybe a few keywords, right? So to do that, you actually need to put in extra work. Uh, work. You need video and you need a transcript. So the transcript can be found by Google. And the video is viewed by people. So you need to do two approaches. So you can do several things. Of course, there are a lot more things you can do. Uh, how to post your video. You can put it on YouTube, which is owned by Google. You can put it on something like a Vimeo, which is a corporate kind of web hosting, uh, video hosting, that is not bad. You can do a lot more things with it. Right? There are a lot of alternatives, but these are some of the common ones. Or you can self-host. Now, if you self-host, you cannot put it on your web post just like that, because it's not made for good quality streaming. So what you do is you do a pointer to a Amazon S3 Club front which is basically the cloud. You know, now everyone's talking about cloud computing, right? So Amazon provides a very cheap uh, a way of hosting your high density video. So Amazon has all these redundant servers worldwide. So basically it's very cheap. You just have to know that Amazon is cheap, but you need some technical expertise to put it up. Uh, YouTube is the simplest, least technical expertise required, but it has these problems. You can't really control what you want. Okay? So you look at the spectrum of control versus uh, price. Okay, here's some technical stuff again. Uh, this is video resolution. So nowadays when we talk about video, we're talking, we always hear these two words, HD. What is HD? High definition, right? So what is HD? You're looking at 1080p, which means 1080 pixels across. Okay, so that's uh, HD. 720p, 720 pixels across is still considered HD, but not full HD. So those are the two things that you need to know. People like HD quality video. DVD, as you realize, is a lot smaller. It's about a quarter smaller than 720. So it's not half, but actually a quarter smaller. Okay, so you can imagine DVD is not very high quality. And now people are even moving beyond HD. I'm sure some of you have heard, have you heard of this camera called RED? R-E-D. Yes? Yes? Anyone else heard of RED? Nobody. It changes the entire paradigm of filmmaking because, let me try to find an object. Okay, in the, in the old days, a video camera would look something like that, right? Now with fat lens here, right? right? Now the red camera is about this size. It's just this size, this block here. And now you can change lenses. Uh, basically, it's a camera that you can take with you to make 4K, 4,000 pixels across film. <coughs> So it's an implication of something like RAID. RAID is a camera that is now maybe about 30,000 US dollars for a camera that small and has produced movies. Most of the blockbusters you see today are produced on a camera like RAID. For example, The Hobbit. Anyone watch Hobbit? Yes. yes, Hobbit. Full quality, produced on a camera that small. Okay? And in the old days, I always, I always marvel how those video men can carry those gigantic cameras, right? On steady cam with the bad harness and everything, they have to be really strong and they have to have a lot of physical endurance because they're moving and the director say, cut and then NG and then reshoot and then carry the equipment again, right? So, Video Man has transformed from that era to a camera now that is this small. In fact, the rate is so good in terms of resolution that fashion photographers for glamorous fashion magazines like Cosmopolitan and all those fancy ladies' magazines, right? are now shooting still pictures and video at the same time using RAID. That was never possible before. In the old days, you have a professional photographer taking a big Hasselblad camera and then mounting with this flash, take a still. If they want to shoot a video, a video man will move in and shoot the video. Now the fashion photographer will double up as a videographer using one small camera, like the RAID, 
to shoot both still and video at the same time. That is the paradigm shift. Video is moving to a totally different paradigm at cinema quality, 4,000 pixels across that you can see on a big screen. Okay. okay, now let's talk about microphone. This is a stuff that you really have to know because uh, when we take up, let's say, a smartphone, right? This will be what we call the omnidirectional microphone, which means something like that. Okay, this kind of omnidirectional microphone means that it will pick up ambient noise all over. You see the the you know the pattern, the polar pattern of the sound pick up. It means that if I'm recording uh, you, right? I'm a journalist. I'm for for a company. I need to interview you, uh, the interviewee, with this microphone. You will pick up the ambient noise. So if I'm out there in the city street where, let's say, Orchard Road, and people are just moving to and fro, to and fro, it will pick up all the noise around as well as the speaking voice of the interviewee. Now let's go in back, because if you like ambient sound, then that's okay. But if you want pure, good quality vocals, you don't get it, right? So only directional mics has its purpose for recording live sound in a big space, where it's terrible at recording interviews, okay? Now you have a cardioid, cardioid uh, microphone as well as a shotgun. Now, you see that camera over there? It has that long, uh, what we call the day cap, right? you know, like that for reading. Right? Okay, so that is a shotgun microphone. A shotgun microphone means that it's very directional. That means if I'm interviewing someone, it should only pick up sound from that person as much as possible. You see the sound pattern? It will pick up a lot less from the ambient sound. It's impossible to say only pick up sound one way, so you still see some pick up at the other side. So if you look at a shotgun, you must be careful as the video man or the interview the interviewer not to talk while he's talking because it will pick up sound of you, right? You see the sound pick up. So as the interview, we is talking, you have to stop talking. And then you point it back at yourself and you can start talking again, okay? Oh, by the way, the big cat has a purpose. Uh, it's not that creative. Okay? So you see the furry thing on these long mics, right? The big cat is meant to muffle out wind noise. So if I'm interviewing someone out there on the street, there will be wind, right? So it will, uh, filter out the wind sound. So that's what it's for. Uh, it's, it, it kind of looks cool, but it's actually a, for a function. Okay. okay, so some of the things that you need to have in order to shoot a good quality corporate communication type of video will be you do not need a big video camera. Okay, that era is gone. Please do not purchase one of those because it's heavy, it's difficult, you can't get accessories, etc. Right? And in fact, many of the expensive big cameras have what we call fixed lenses, which means is it's no good, okay? The lens may be a long zoom and you cannot take out, remove that lens. So never buy a video camera that you cannot remove the lens for proper communication purpose. Let me explain that in a later uh, uh, slide why we need interchangeable lens cameras. Okay? So what you can do is to buy what we call a HD, a, a HD capable DSLR, which is a camera like that, right? You don't have to buy big brands. Uh, you can buy any brand as long as you can change the lens. Look for a few things. Um, within the camera, you will need an ability to add a microphone. Because not all cameras allow you to attach a microphone. Then that's a no-go, because it means that you cannot get good quality sound. Sound is, always remember for video, sound must be above video. Sound is more important than video. So, you need a very good microphone. If you have to invest something, invest in a good microphone. Okay? Uh, you need some kind of stabilization. Um, so, in the old days, you see the camera being shoulder mount mounted, right? Now the cameras are so small, you can't shoulder mount it, right? Because the camera will be so small that you can't really put it here, right? You can't see the screen. So how do you mount those things? I'll show you in a, in a short clip that I put together later. Uh, NLE means non-linear editor. That means it's a software that basically allows you to cut and stitch your videos together, right? So you can use something like an iMovie on your Mac or you know, one of those very simple video editors to stitch together. Remember for communication, uh, like we said, 500 million views of a baby biting the finger of the brother certainly has no special effects. So when we think about good quality video, don't think special effects, but think good quality audio, think good composition, and think how to choose the right lens to get that image that you want. I'll explain what all those means in a while. So of course you need one of the online video accounts to host the video, okay? Okay, so this is typically the setup. I'm 
Okay, you saw that a lot. Okay, I'll show you this thing because you see you just have let's say a smartphone, right? And you have kind of what we call a tripod adapter. You, you need something like that to attach your phone to it, right? So that you can now mount it on the tripod. Because oh. smartphones you can't mount it, you need uh, one of these adapters, which is very cheap, right? So you see for this purpose it has multiple tripod adapters, which means that you can now mount it on a stabilizing rig like that. Uh, just now Ping Han and I were talking about Kickstarter.com. This product called Pico Steady was funded successfully on uh, Kickstarter. I bought one of those. Uh, it's, a, it's a small stabilization that looks like an engineering product. It doesn't look like something made very easy by the big brands. It's very cheap, but it works. It's about 100 bucks. And with this, you can create what we call steady cam effects. That means cameras can never be steady. Remember that we say, you know, it's, it's uh, shoulder mounted. In video, you need almost like to create a tripod effect. So when you have a big video camera, your shoulder becomes one of the three points of stabilization, right? The other being your legs, right? And then you have rigs that has front handles, then you will create three points of stabilization. You need at least three points of stabilization for video, okay? So for this, it creates what we call a floating effect. So that means I can now run, I can bounce around, and the video is stable. That's what you see in cinema quality videos, films. They use steady cams. They are much bigger than this. But with this small device, you can now take a smartphone or a light camera like that and mount it on this $100 device and produce steady cam effects. You no longer need to spend $1,000 for expensive steady cam, but you can use something like that to produce a good, stable video. Okay, so if you want to go live, okay, just now that was about stabilization, about what kind of equipment you need. Now if you want to go live, you need something extra. You need to choose a camera, you need to look at the side of the camera before you buy, that it has a HDMI port. Most television sets today are HDMI capable. If you, let's say, subscribe to StarHub Cable or something, you'll notice that the modern encoders, uh, decoders, have a HDMI cable out to your television set. So HDMI is the consumer standard for good quality uh, video output. Not many cameras out there have HDMI out. They may have HDMI port, but that out is what we call unclean HDMI. That means you can plug the cable to a television set, but you cannot press record the video at the same time the video is showing on the television set. Very important differentiator. That means if you cannot do that, right, you cannot do live streaming. Because live streaming demands that the video, the video feed from the camera is out. Uh, that means you can output to the HDMI at the same time the camera is capturing the image. Not many cameras can do that. But there are cheap ones that can do that, like the Panasonic that you see here. So I'll show you that as a sample. Uh, you need a good microphone, like what you see there. Uh, stabilization. And you need to understand this thing called real-time messaging protocol. So you need to set up a streaming account that will take that feed from your camera to the internet. Now how to take that feed to the, to the uh, what you call to the internet? The camera is not connected to the internet, correct? So you need what we call a HDMI encoder. In the old days, in fact, I just talked to a video man recently. He's carrying this big equipment, and he saw me doing live streaming. We were at the same event. I used this encoder, which is the size of uh, maybe a deck of cards. It's a small device with two antenna that I attach on through the HDMI port to the camera, and I stream to the internet. He looked at it and said, wow, you know, the guys who told me this kind of thing can only be done by a rack-mounted deck that costs many thousands of dollars. I told him that device costs about 1,005 US the one that I'm using. Deck of cards, attach it onto my camera, I can run with my camera and shoot video and stream live to the internet. Anyone can watch real time that same footage that I'm shooting. What I'm seeing through the lens in the video camera is now seen live at the same time to any amount of people out there using a small encoder no bigger than the size of a deck of cards. <coughs> So you see, that, that's the small decoder I'm talking about. It just plug in through the HDMI port into your camera. That's it. It's a small device that you, you set up, you know, you set up all your Wi-Fi or whatever. It will work with Wi-Fi so that if you, let's say, in a room like that that has maybe resistant right to Wi-Fi, you instantly stream to internet. If you don't have Wi-Fi, there's a USB port in front. Plug in one of the modern 4G modems, right, from any of the providers. You can stream live out of the field. Just like that. And just think about it. Just about two or three years ago, 
someone in a standard broadcaster will be carrying a big van of equipment to do satellite real-time broadcasting. Now, with something like that, you can stream live HD quality video just like that. Out of you. Same thing, just using something like that, a small camera this time. So there you have it, some of the very basic uh, equipment that you need to look at to consider how to acquire video and then stream it live to the internet. What are some of the considerations in terms of sound? Now let's take it a step further. We want to look beyond just producing video, you know, video that we shoot of our families, or, you know, the typical stuff. Think like a filmmaker, how do we shoot corporate video that people may find it more interesting to watch, not just, uh, you know, the typical run of the new stuff. So, remember that Olive movie, we want to do something like that, okay? Or Hobbit, right? So, two things, you need to remember to have a good story. And second thing is to bring focus and clarity to the image. That's what differentiates the typical still image, video uh, footage, compared to film. I'm not sure whether you notice it, but I'm going to show you a slide and then you can see the difference. Okay, now we see on the right hand side, okay? This is a photograph taken of objects at varying depth, okay? Uh, the foreground object, the Nivea thing, right? Now, I use a standard lens, 40mm lens, at f16. I'll explain all that in a while, okay? You realize that I can see the keyboard and all the clutter behind? Imagine this same scene is a person and the background. That means the person is the foreground and the background is the scenery. Now, that means that the scenery and the person are all in focus with a very big f-stop, right? Now you see on the picture on the left, with a very wide open f-stop of 1.7, big difference. Can you see the keyboard? You can't, right? That's what differentiates film, good quality film, from a typical video, depth of field. That's why in the, uh, uh, early on I said, don't purchase a video camera that has unchangeable lens, fixed lens, because the depth of field of those lenses tend to be uh, a higher number. If you look at lenses, right, typically they'll start at, let's say, f3.5. And if you zoom, that means you go to tele, then we go to f5.6, or f7, or whatever it may be. And at a very high f-stop, that means less light reaches the lens, the sensor. Yet at a very wide open f-stop, like f1, for example, more light reaches the sensor. Multiple benefits. First of all, to learn out the background. Second thing, more light comes in means that you can shoot with no grain. Image. And a, a very little light tend to have a lot of grain. That means they look grainy. They don't look nice, right? So at a, at a very wide open edge stop, the image will look clean. You have sharp lines. You don't have dots on the image. You don't have dirty noise and all that and all those color noise. And then you can isolate the object against its background. So that's what differentiates uh, filmmaking from video. You need an interchangeable lens camera typically. So when you interview a guest, for example, let's say you do a video interview, you may want to blur up, let's say, the food in the background. I'm interviewing, say, Rito, right? I can put, uh, put a, a, a camera in front of him, and then I'll blur up the background. But I will need a lens with a very wide open f stop. Okay? So, there you have it. Some of the very basic tips on how to do video, what are the things to look out for, equipment to consider, as well as how to think like a filmmaker. You need to isolate the object. So, if you look, if you recall now, you know, if you go back, watch a movie or on cable or TV or whatever, start look, thinking like a filmmaker. I challenge you to do that. At least you watch a movie, maybe even after this, go to the cinema. 100% I can guarantee you that you'll notice that the foreground is always isolated and the background is always blurred. <coughs> Typically, two people will be engaging in conversation and the background will be completely blurred out. So that the, the human eye is now brought into focus on what the director or the filmmaker wants you to see. The human eye is very interesting because we can never shut up everything. If you don't believe me, you look around the room right now. We cannot isolate the background, okay? Our eyes are incapable of doing that. Our eyes is like a very big f-stop thing, right? F-16 or f-22, and we look at everything is in focus. We cannot blur out anything in our visual range. That's what makes movies very different from our eyesight. So we must think differently from how we perceive the world by forcing the viewer to zoom in only on the things you want them to see. So that's how you think like a filmmaker. So I challenge you, go and watch a movie, watch on cable, watch in the cinema, rent a DVD, and then you choose a favorite movie. And then you run through the entire film and analyze the scene. Another thing you need to consider is composition. We call it the rule of thirds in photography. That means 
you know, you basically dissect a, a white panoramic screen into nine squares, right? So three by three. So how do you compose the image? Try not to center the object in the center because it feels very artificial. Because in real life, objects are never centered. Objects are, you know, all over, right? It creates dynamism. So imagine, you know, again, go watch a movie, try that and think like a filmmaker. The person, let's say, at the foreground and the person at the background may form what we call vanishing lines. So they are, they are not straight next to each other, but maybe they are like that. So they create kind of a, um, it throws you off balance, right? So one person may be more focused, the face will be more focused on the top uh, a square of the nine square, and the other person is on the bottom, or some maybe even at the, the, the right hand second square, right? So you need to think like a filmmaker how to throw people off balance so that you know you're engaged, your attention is on the, the subject, and also blur the background. So that's basically some of the tips on how to think like a filmmaker. Questions? Uh, my name is Seamus. Uh, today I run a, a social media and publicity company. So we do um, we help clients actually reach out to the media and the public through a variety of means. Uh, this could be all kinds of communication. Traditionally, it would be written communication. So we send out things like press releases, talk to the media, get the news published and all that. But I think communication has reached a whole new paradigm. So increasingly, you will see that communication is no longer text-centric, but video-centric. Because uh, if we take the MRT, many of us take the MRT or the buses, you will see young people now staring and poring over a rectangular device. Whether that be a handphone or some kind of tablet and plug in with their earphones or even big headphones. So they are now absorbed into the world of, um, well, kind of like multimedia, but increasingly video. So video has been very uh, prohibitive in the old days. Uh, I'm sure many of us here in the room have uh, seen those video cameras costing, uh, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars that you need to carry on your shoulder. And they're almost always shoulder mounted and they weigh maybe not a ton, but like, you know, five to seven kg. And then you have long lenses and the tapes, and then you have magnetic tapes. And then when you take the tapes out, you can't really use the, the content yet because you need to actually bring it into a form that you can edit. So when you bring an analog media uh, of a video tape into a non-linear digital platform, there's already a degradation of video signal. So you lose colors, you lose resolu resolution, and you increase noise. So in the old days when we do broadcast uh, video for clients, old days meaning in the 1990s, right? That's about a decade ago. There was a lot of generation loss of uh, the video content the minute we convert it into a digital platform. So when you want to do, let's say, uh, news videos for clients, the minute that you shoot the video and convert it to a, a digital, uh, you know, on your computer, already you lost one generation down. And then when you make copies of that for the media, you lose another generation. So generation loss was uh, something very common for the analog video era, which was just about 10 years ago. But today, when we shoot video, it's fully digital. The minute we take that video, uh, the video file, put it into your computer, and you do non-linear editing, if you don't do any uh, lossy kind of compression, then the video actually stays quite, quite the same size, the same quality. You don't really lose quality anymore today. And of course, uh, cameras, like you see here, uh, uh, you know, a simple micro forte camera, will cost you no more than one to $2,000. Anybody can use it to acquire HD quality video suitable for uh, DVD kind of format. So okay, let's, um, I, I adapted this talk that I did for clients and marketing for educators. So the content is about the same, except that uh, we need to orient it in the educator's scenario. <laughs> okay, so this is a movie called Olive. It's about a girl that throughout the entire movie doesn't really talk. Uh, she will then interact with people and bring a, a kind of a meaning of life to all these people that she interact with, all much older people. And this movie was created entirely on a cell phone. If any one of you use a Nokia phone, this entire movie, full feature cinema movie, was produced on a Nokia cell phone. That, that is how I think the world has changed. It's to show you that cinema making today is about the message and not the gear. It's no longer about how expensive your equipment is. This is a full feature movie, and there are many such movies in the making that use cell phones. Well, at least in part of the movie, but this one was entirely produced on a Nokia uh, smartphone. Okay. So, we're going to talk about the spectrum of communication that we use. Why use video for education at all, if we can use any other means? Uh, what are some of the digital online video platforms that we can look at? How to produce online video? 
uh, using various types of equipment. Well, it could be a smartphone, it could be a simple uh, camera today, and how to go live to the world. Which means um, we can produce a quiet video, but we can also turn that video live, live streaming to the world. That can be done today very easily. Uh, well, in no more than let's say with a small box of equipment that is maybe a, a size of a deck of cards and the equipment will cost you no more than, let's say, a uh, same $2,000. And then, of course, going beyond, thinking out of the box, that education doesn't have to be boring, we can think like a filmmaker. So how do we think like a filmmaker when we make video? Okay, so in the old days, we had things like text, we had art, we had audio files, we had online, we had video, and then some kind of gamification and interactive content. Um, all these are good in terms of communicating to our intended audience, the students, or any kind of learners. Um, they all have their use, although increasingly you will see either some kind of convergence to, towards video, convergence towards gamification, convergence towards some kind of a social platform. But these are mere tools. Uh, these tools should not distract from learning, and any of these tools, as long as they reach the goals of learning, then they're useful. Right? So, if we know that, let's say, 70% today of the students are looking at video on a smartphone, then maybe that is the media that we can exploit to reach out to this young uh, generation, the millennial generation. Today's newspaper and today, I mean the today newspaper, as in the you know the one with the red logo, uh, one of the fathers of the internet says the future of education is the web. Now of course, Doctor Sir, he he is of the old school, right? As many of us are. So when he talk about the web, he will talk about it from a traditional paradigm. Now when we look at the web, we should look at it at a new paradigm, something ahead of the time. Uh, bandwidth is getting very prevalent. When I take out my smartphone uh, on four G, I typically can get better data throughput from my 4G smartphone than the Wi-Fi when I sit in the cafe. Often I'll just turn off my Wi-Fi altogether and just use my 4G. Which means that if you talk about things like live streaming, imagine you shoot a video on your smartphone and you want to live stream it to the world uh, or even upload to say YouTube, there is a higher likelihood that your 4G connection can serve you better than the typical Wi-Fi in a cafe. But that is the reality that we live in. Which means 4G has enabled the use of video which previously was a very high bandwidth medium, not possible to stream, not possible to easily uh, wrestle with. Today, video has become something that we can even tackle on the smartphone. So that's something in our pocket. So why use video for education? Uh, that data obviously has changed. Everybody knows that video is the top viewed video on YouTube. I think now it's about 1.2 uh, billion uh, page views on that video. Right? So this is of course a very professionally produced video that spent a lot of money to make. But the point is, it has shown that online video has become the new paradigm. Everybody's watching it. And one, uh, well, at that point when it was the uh, end of last year, the second most viewed was, uh, I think it was uh, a baby who beat the finger of the elder brother. That was the second most viewed video. And that is, uh, you know, home produced, using a cell phone, you shoot with just the cell phone and upload it. It was funny because it was a toddler that beat the finger of a very, well, a young boy or a, an elder brother. That went to number two. I think about 500 over a uh, thousand uh, uh, views. So, so right now I think that dropped to number seven, but in that whole range you see all kinds of videos have taken over the traditional forms of uh, reaching out to people. So it can be professional and it doesn't have to be professional, it can be really simple. So, as we are seeing today, nobody, not many people actually read print anymore. Uh, those of us who are old school today still read books. I still enjoy books very much. But when I sit in a cafe, say in a Starbucks or whatever coffee bean, I might be the only person reading, uh, say, a thick cover book, non-fiction. I look around, there's no one else reading non-fiction books. Maybe there's a Harry Potter here and there, and the rest are maybe magazines, and then the rest are uh, phones and tablets. So the world has transformed whereby print is not as important anymore. Even media, I used to be a journalist, so I've worked for many print magazines, and many print magazines have actually died along those years, right up to today. So when you think about um, why video, Cisco, the networking, the enterprise networking company, well, many years ago, 2011 is like a long time back, right? Online video will be greater than 50% of the entire net traffic, which equates to about 792 million users, and mobile video will reach to 271 million users, or 1.6 billion, just in a few years' time. So that is the paradigm that Cisco, the enterprise networking company, is looking at. And why are they interested? Because they, they have the backbone equipment that power many of the internet networks today. 
and they need to look at how to actually put, push this traffic out effectively with the equipment. So they need to understand how to actually grapple with this kind of paradigm. And Cisco itself is very interesting. They have also moved away from a traditional networking company to also creating their own online newsroom. In fact, Cisco is one of those few technology companies that actually have a broadcast studio and broadcast equipment of their own. They produce their own broadcast news. Quite interesting uh, to look at their stuff. Okay, so if we are thinking of reaching out to many people, then of course we need to look at this concept of search engine uh, optimization. If you want to reach out to the public, right? The higher, uh, so called, the higher you are on a search engine uh, rank, then the easier your content will be found. So if we were to look at some of this stuff, right? Video can also be a very interesting way to increase your page rank of your content. Let's say we develop an educational uh, uh, program. If we are on the internet, Unless it's actually optimized for search engines to find, actually not many human beings can find it. So that is something that we as educators also need to look at. How to optimize the content such that they can be found by all that digital highway out there so that our learners can find them. So you realize that we as educators have to actually become somewhat of a jack of all trades to understand the paradigm of the internet, how to exploit it, how to maximize our content to be found on the internet. This can be done in a variety of ways. Um, text content is very important so that they can be found. Good content is very important. And when you do video, the thing is that every good quality video should always have a full text transcript. That's how you increase the page rate of your content. So when you create video content, hopefully we can also develop a nice, lengthy, fully elaborated text transcript of that video. So when you teach a class, the class could be one hour, let's have the full one hour of text transcript because it will help your content reach out to the public. Um, in the 1990s, right, uh, we didn't even have DVDs. I can't even remember when DVD came about, but before that it was PAL and NTSC, and that's like a fraction of the DVD dimensions, right? And then we have now HD 720 pixels across uh, the down, and then we have 1080 pixels down, and then now we're looking at 2K. Uh, Blackmagic is one of those very innovative Australian companies that created um, film, film capable cameras to produce films, right? That fit in the size of your hand. If you go to any shop, let's say Cathay Photo or whatever, you look out for a, a product that's uh, a size of about this big. Okay? This Blackmagic cinema will give you 2K resolution video, which is higher than HD, right? That you can actually produce full feature films. Filmmakers have actually used black magic to produce films. And that camera is not even expensive. Guess how much the black magic camera costs? Anybody want to have a guess? Some of you might actually have tried it, right? Yes? No? How many thousand? Two thousand? Uh, yes, there's a version coming up. <laughs> <laughs> really? They actually come there. Uh, black magic actually uh, uh, announced that they have the black magic pocket cinema, which is about the size of your handphone, and you will be able to have interchangeable lenses using one of these uh, micro water lenses, and it will produce film. Uh, but the one that I was talking about is the Black Magic Cinema, cost you about $4,000. That was unheard of to produce cinema quality film. $4,000. <coughs> size of your, uh, you know, you can hold it in your hand. You can actually use it by holding it. It's not something that you need a professional videographer to have lots of expensive rigs that is tied to your waist and all kinds of stuff to stabilize the stuff. It's something that you can hold in your hand that will take in any consumer camera lenses. And then 4K. 4K resolution means 4,000 pixels, right? So that is the ultimate right now for a really high resolution big screens that you can even have in your home. Sony launched 4K uh, resolution TVs, uh, monitors. Uh, 4K is also now the standard for many of the feature films that you see in cinema. Anyone here watch The Hobbit? Yes, Hobbit? Yes. Hobbit is one of those films produced entirely using digital 4K cameras. Uh, again, those cameras are not huge. They are about the size of um, about the size of this cube size device. Okay, so about this size. And you have 4K resolution, cinema quality film, like The Hobbit. I'm sure you have seen Hobbit in the theaters. You know how good that looks. So the, the creative acquisition equipment has come down in cost as well as dimensions. You no longer have filmmakers, cinematographers, directors of photography holding big giant rigs that you cannot wrestle with and you need two person 
two, uh, well, most likely three person to handle the camera. One guy will be pouring at the monitor, another guy will be turning the knob to focus, right? And then another fellow will be handling the rest of the stuff. So you need two to three person to handle a traditional camera. Today, with something like that, one person is your crew. You can even acquire sound if you wanted to. So that, that, that paradigm of filmmaking has changed in terms of all kinds of stuff. Number of people, cost, dimension of the equipment, as well as the resolution of the stuff. And you don't even need to develop film anymore. But well, we all know that Kodak is near there and Fuji is uh, sort of there. So film is something that is uh, it's going to be a dinosaur, right? So when you develop film, you don't know until you see the film develop. Then you know whether that, that, that real, really, you know, whatever that you did to it. But now digital, the minute you put it into the computer, you see exactly what you shot. You can even play that on your uh, camera and see exactly what you shot, more or less. Okay, another thing that we need to look at is sound. Uh, when we as educators want to produce videos, producing the video or capturing video is the easiest part of the equation. Any smartphone, any camera can capture half-decent video. That is a guarantee to you. You pick up any device today, you can easily capture quite usable video. But the trick is sound. Sound is often the failure of all video acquisition, which is why if you look at many of the traditional process or even current process of filmmaking, you'll get a guy with a camera, right? And then there'll be another guy with a long pole and a microphone. I'm sure you've seen that, right? Because sound acquisition is an entirely different area of science altogether. So you need to understand sound as well as sight. So doing the sight is easy. We'll show you in a, in a short while what capturing video means, uh, the images, and then you need to understand how to capture sound. So the, the three different patterns of sound in a microphone, right? Uh, like one of these microphones will be what we call a omnidirectional microphone. So it will capture sound all around. The spectrum of sound that it captures is all around. It creates a very rich atmosphere to the sound, but it also captures noise. Okay. So let's say if we want to do, uh, uh, let's say we are the, the lecturers and we want to capture ourselves. And we are sitting in our office, putting the camera in front of me and capturing myself talking, right, in a, a simple video like that. Then we cannot use the um, only directional mic because you'll catch yourself all around, including when someone walks past our cubicles, slamming the door outside or doing something outside because it captures the sound spectrum all around. So we don't use that kind of mic. Then there's a kind of uh, mic which captures sound in front of it but not behind it. So that's not bad. There's some kind of directional acquisition of sound now. That's good enough, right? But if you really wanted to, you can use a shotgun, which is similar to what I mounted on the camera. That's a shotgun microphone. So again, the spectrum of sound is more limited. It doesn't get sound around, around it, except mostly in front and a little bit behind. Which is why if you were to do a video acquisition of your own using a camera like that with a microphone, we should not be breathing too hard or talking very loud. <laughs> because it does capture sound behind, which is facing us, right? So if, imagine that mic is facing your interviewee, right? <coughs> and we are behind it. If we are talking, then we'll be capturing our own voice. So that's why cameramen tend to have very zen-like, yoga-like breathing patterns so that they can keep very silent, not move very much, and then, you know, the interviewee is talking in front. Okay, so these are the kind of patterns that we need to look at in a microphone. All good microphones, whether Sennheiser, Shure, and all that, will show you the polar patterns on the microphone. So you just need to look for a microphone that can work with a camera. And there are even microphones of this kind, let's say shotgun microphones, that can work with your cell phone. I'll show you what I mean. So this is a typical iPhone. Okay? This is what we actually do to capture, uh, to make short films using an iPhone. So you just slot in this iPhone into this, right? And then it will come with interchangeable lens. So this is a lens. So this is a lens that you can actually attach to the, the this contraption, right? And you can have a blind. Okay. So if you notice that there are actually tripod mounts, and then there are these gaps, right? So this this will allow you to actually mount your microphone, which will then plug into your the sound jack, and then you can mount it on a tripod, just like any uh, camera. So the beauty of this device is that it's cheap, it's easy, you can have changeable lens and you work with your mobile phone. So you can even hold it because it has this nice grip to hold it like a camera, right? So that's how you actually, uh, yes, one thing to note is when you shoot with your 
your phone, never hold the phone this way up because you'll get unusable video because no TV monitor is particular about quality. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, most of the video that we produce will never become a DVD because there's no need to because the greatest, most pervasive platform out there is on the web. So to produce video for the web, these are some of the considerations that we need to have. Uh, decent, well, I just used DSLR, but you could very well use a mirrorless camera like a Nix or a, a Sony Nix or a Olympus OMD or Panasonic Lumix and all that stuff. Mm, you can also use a, like a Sony VG20, which is a simple uh, APS-C format sensor camera that has interchangeable lens. So you, you have the choices. That means you can have very simple cameras that have uh, fixed lenses to cameras that you can change lenses. The thing is that you don't, you don't need to go all the way to the other end of the spectrum. Some people love those giant Canon and Nikon DSLRs. You, you don't need it, okay? You must always remember that capturing still images, still photos, is different from capturing HD video. The sensor, if it's catered for still photos, is many times way over the resolution of HD video. Therefore, the most expensive DSLR don't usually produce video that's much better than a cheaper camera. <coughs> Illustration in point, many of the uh, big giant Canon or Nikon cameras will produce video worse than this camera here. This is the Lumix GH3, made for HD video. So you need to look for cameras that are decent in size, so that you can handle it, so that they're not too heavy, interchangeable lens if you would like, and not necessarily very high-end, because it's not necessary for video. One of the things that you must find in a camera, however, is that your camera must have a microphone jack. All cameras, such as you know, one of these uh, smartphones or whatever, or simple point-and-shoot cameras, will be able to shoot, uh, shoot HD video these days. But not many cameras has a microphone jack. If you don't have a microphone jack, you cannot connect an external microphone, i.e. you don't get good sound. Right? So you need to find a camera that has a microphone jack. In the case of the GH3, it's very interesting. It's also the cheapest camera that has both a microphone jack and a headphone jack. Now, why is that important? If I were to interview myself or interview you, right? let's say you, are, uh, you were to produce a manufacturing process workflow video. Now, you hold that camera and you go down to the shop floor and you want to interview someone, right? But the shop floor may be quite noisy. You're not sure how the sound will turn out. If there's no way to monitor the sound with a headphone, you really don't know what happens until you shot the video, go back to your computer, plug in the SD card, and look at the video and hear it. By then, it may be too late. Then you will need a reshoot. So if you can, also look for a camera that has a headphone jack so that you can actually monitor the sound as you're doing the recording. So if there's some problems with the recording, you can always cut and then reshoot a particular segment, but you don't need to go back to the place to reshoot again. So that's the thing that the kind of consideration. You need a good microphone. Very interestingly, good microphones can cost more than your camera. This is not really a fantastic microphone. I can't afford it. But if you wanted to, a microphone may cost more than your camera. So uh, if you go to a shop and then they quote you a price, don't fall off your chair because that's normal. A good microphone costs more than a, you know, an ordinary camera. You need some kind of a software on your computer. Uh, most of us here will use Windows computers. That's fine. There are tools for that. You can also use a Mac. As any of these computers, you can actually use a software to do non-linear editing, NLE we call it. That means when we put in a video on your computer, it's one long file, right? Let's say we did a one hour session of a class. There will be some front portions that we want to cut out. There will be some back portions that we want to cut out. In between, maybe we have a tea break, we want to cut that out as well, right? Because those are rubbish. So in order to do that, you can use a software to do these cuts. As educators, we are not here to produce a Spielberg movie. So we don't need the special effects. We just need a cuts-only editing. So we just need to cut the front, cut the back, and cut the middle, or cut whatever we want to cut, and then stitch them together. So that is easy for us as educators, because we're not going to produce feature films unless we choose to. Right? You will need some kind of an online video account to host the video. Um, you can host it on things like YouTube, email, Twitter, you know, many different platforms. You can even track who view your videos, how many people view your videos, where they come from, and all that stuff. So those are useful for educators because you want to know how many people view it, right? And if you want to sell your video content, some of these platforms even allow you to do pay gating. That means 
you don't watch a video, you can watch a trailer, you can watch part of it, but until you give me your credit card details, you can't view the full video. So if you decide to charge for your content, you can also do that. So like we said, it's really not about how expensive your products are. We look at some of those setups that we talked about. Okay, here is the typical setup, similar to what you see here. This was a, a if we have time, I'll show you the full video at the end, which takes about three minutes, okay? This is a video to showcase how a camera like that can capture cinema quality films. This is a short film, just a three minute one, okay? So you see the guy has a, a, a microphone mounted on his camera, and he's just having a steady cam. The steady cam, that, the device that he's holding on, is basically for having very stable video. What happened is that, most of the videos that we produce using our cell phones are shaky, right? I think Nokia, maybe Sony are the only smartphones that have what we call optical image stabilization, OIS. That means that even if the hand shakes, nobody can be rock steady, right? So even if the hand shakes, that software inside will be able to calibrate the image such that it becomes steady. What they do is a trick. Let's say you capture this size of the image. What they do is basically crop the image towards the center and then they identify a, a, a point in the image and then they will keep that crop inside floating within that so that the rest is cut. So there is a trade-off because part of your image actually gets cut off using OIS. But it doesn't matter, there are tools to help you to get steady uh, 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 video. So this steady cam is a device. Uh, there are many different makes, so it doesn't matter what brand you have. There are smaller ones. In fact, there's even one that I bought from um, uh, Kickstarter, which cost me only about 130 US. As a foldable device that has variable weights that can mount my handphone or a small camera and then have very steady video. So what happens is even if I'm running, I'm walking, I'm running, the video will be stable because it will then counterbalance using the laws of physics against your movement. So you get film quality steady video, which is what we want as video makers, right? So this is the basic that a typical filmmaker or videographer can use. Uh, in this case, it's a, just a simple camera, interchangeable lens with a good shotgun microphone mounted on a tripod. You can also mount this whole setup on a steady cam type device uh, or a variety of other means. Okay? So there are many ways to actually mount such things. So now this is the thing I'm talking about. So this device costs you 130 US bucks, right? And it's foldable, you can collapse it, keep it in a small little bag, uh, smaller than a laptop bag. And then you can use weights to counterbalance your camera and then you adjust your camera forward or backward and the right way until you get a very steady video. Um, there, there are techniques to train, the te teach you how to do that. It's, it's a technique and you need to actually try it out. Okay, so those are the simple video equipment that we can use to produce video if we, uh, if we want to acquire video and then play that on demand. Now there's also there are those times where we want the video to go live to the world at the same time we are speaking or shooting. For example, let's say you have a live event, you're covering a particular event, uh, you want that event live to the world. Similar to what CNN or Channel News Asia or any of those broadcast stations do, traditionally those equipment, uh, I've spoken to some videographers, they say, oh, that kind of equipment costs you in the region of five figure and above. Today, that, 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 that paradigm has changed. That device is the size of a deck of cards and costs you about 1,005 US. Okay? So, all those setups, and then you mount this deck of card size device on top, it will then work with your cell phone uh, using uh, Wi-Fi, or you can even use a 3G or 4G cellular modem attached to it. And that's all you need. Imagine that, let's say if you have Wi-Fi on your handphone, and then you have 4G on your handphone, you can connect the two devices wirelessly, and you can stream your video live to the world at the same time you're shooting. For no more than about 1,005 and the size of that cards. And Let's say we are the educators and we want to shoot ourselves, not with a gun, right? But with a device that can acquire video as we move around the room, there are also those kind of gadgets that we can get. For example, a swivel. A swivel will allow you to mount your smartphone on it, and then you wear this little tag on you, and as you walk the room, that camera right, will auto-track your movements and record you as you move around the room automatically. So you don't even need cameraman this day. The device, the little device that costs you a couple of hundred dollars, will be able to track you as you walk to and fro the lecture theatre. As long as you wear that little tag on you, right? And they even had a new device that came out from the same company, Swiver, that will allow you to put your iPad on it 
and use the iPad as the filmmaking tool, and then it will swivel to and track you as you move to and fro the lecture theater. But that is more interesting, right, as you move uh, in the theater. A competing product is called Solo Shop. You can also use that. So this is a device I was talking about. It's by a company called Teradek. Uh, they make all kinds of these HDMI or SDI streaming encoders. What that means is that they connect by HDMI to your camera, which is basically the stuff that you plug your typical TV to, right? The TV is typically today a HDMI device. Uh, so the cable that you see behind will connect to this little bag of cut size device that has two antennas, right? And then you'll be able to stream to the world with this device, and um, you can mount it on the camera. So you realize that with this simple video camera, I just simply mount it on top, and we have used something like that to actually shoot live, ev uh, live events uh, for uh, media even in the Philippines. That means my client is in Singapore, and this event is in Singapore, he's talking with some people, I will shoot the video, and the content goes live to uh, journalists in Philippines as they watch real time having cookies, tea, and coffee. On the other side of the world, my client doesn't even have to travel there, and it's live. That means as he talks, the system stream there. Okay, so those are stuff that uh, we are familiar with, which means video is a paradigm we're familiar with. But let's break out of that video paradigm because um, shooting video, anyone can shoot it. And the equipment helps us, right? The equipment will make sure that we can shoot half decent video. But why not go even further? We have seen the Olive trailer. Maybe we should even catch the movie as it comes, right? Um, things like Hobbit or Olive. Think like a filmmaker because that's what really is the next big leap forward as we use video. That means instead of doing the cute videos, instead of doing very documentary style videos, or interview style videos, or self-interviews and all that stuff, there is a way to actually break out of that to tell stories. It will demand a lot more from us as educators because then we need to be storytellers. For example, if we teach engineering, what kind of stories can we tell, right? So we need to actually come up with scripts, to come up with some kind of a storyboard, and then to script the video and then shoot the segment. But all all views can be told in stories, even engineering, and maybe especially engineering, because you have all kinds of you know equipment and people interacting with the equipment. Everything can be made into a movie. So I guess the challenge today as educators is how do we challenge ourselves to think like a filmmaker? We may not produce Gilbert movies or Lucas, but let's make that interesting. So to produce movies. I hope that you can take this experiment home later on, and maybe over this weekend. Watch some movies on cable, on TV, uh, and look at how an image is formed in front of your eye. This is what I'm trying to illustrate. If you are trying to tell a story, we need to bring a focus to an image. So in this case, it's what we call the depth of view. If we take a typical cell phone, Everything that we shoot on it will be in focus. The mic in front of me, this chair, you, and the people behind. Everything will be in focus. What does that mean in a, in a motion picture kind of scenario? That means nothing is in focus. Why? Because if everything is in focus, our human brain cannot process what is the in, uh, message you're trying to tell me. So I hope to challenge you today, or this long week, uh, this, this weekend, to go and watch movies at home, you don't need to go to the theater. Look at how they, how they portray video to you. You will notice very commonly one trick they use is the, depth, the shallow depth of view, which means the mic will be out of focus, this chair will be out of focus, but you are in focus and the rest are blurred. So the rest are blurred, you are in focus and the rest in front of you are blurred as well. So how do we create an image, not a static image, but a motion video that has focus? That is how we tell stories. So great video stories or films must have focus. So how to create a focus? As you can see, there is a physical technique involved. It will demand more from us. Okay? If you take your camera, those that have an interchangeable lens especially, you'll notice that if you use what we call a very small f-stop, it will look different from a very big f-stop. A very small f-stop, let's say f1 point something, or f2, will give you a shallow depth of view, which means the object is in focus and the rest are open, right? Which means the aperture is wide open and then only that subject or object is in focus. But if you use a very big aperture, then everything is in focus and therefore nothing is in focus. Okay? 
So try that as an experiment from today onwards. First of all, look at films on TV and see how they tell their stories. Very often, they will use this shadow depth of field trick. And from today onwards, I also challenge you to try to shoot video and still images with a shadow depth of field. You will suddenly notice your pictures and your videos has a focus. So you can see in that short three minute short film, it's just a promo video like a camera maker. You, you, I think you have noticed how they shot the perspective and brought focus into people and blurring out the background or the foreground. So that's how they told a story where they brought focus into the people or the subject or the object rather than everything's in focus. So that was a very easy to employ uh, trick that anyone can do as a video maker. Well, that's it. I, that's all I have for you. Uh, any questions?